Hello and welcome to our lecture on chapter 10 which covers the urinary system. The term urinary comes from the combining form uro meaning urine and the suffix airy meaning pertaining to. And what our urinary system does is eliminates our waste products that accumulate as a result of cellular metabolism. So let's go ahead and talk about our objectives first. So we're going to learn through the screencast to recognize or write the functions of our urinary system. We want to recognize and write the meanings of chapter 10 word parts and use them to build and analyze terms. We're going to write terms for selected structures of urinary system or match them with their descriptions, write the names of their diagnostic terms, and pathologies related to the urinary system when given their descriptions or match terms with their meanings. Fifth, we are going to match surgical and therapeutic interventions for the urinary system and write the names of their interventions when given their descriptions. And lastly, spell terms for the urinary system correctly. So first we'll talk about the functions of the kidneys. We know that there's four organs that belong to our urinary system, one of them being the kidneys, then we have the ureter, then the urinary bladder, and then the urethra. Okay. So starting off with the kidneys, they are going to maintain the blood volume, pH, and composition. We mentioned this before, that our kidneys will actually filter blood. They are cleansing the blood. And our blood volume is controlled by the amount of urine that's excreted. We've also talked about pH before. Blood pH can fluctuate and become acidic or alkaline. We don't want that to happen. We want it to stay at a pH of a little bit above neutral, which is at 7.4. And this is controlled by how much of certain waste products are eliminated. And then our blood composition is controlled similarly. We also have our maintenance of chemical composition of our blood and excretion of waste products of protein metabolism. So one of our final products of protein metabolism is going to be urea. And this is the main waste that is present in urine. We also have a regulation of blood pressure through the kidneys. This is affected by our blood volume and our volume is affected by how much fluid is excreted in the urine. And lastly, we have stimulation of our erythrocyte production. The kidneys secrete a hormone called erythropoietin, which will stimulate red blood cell production. So on the left here, we can see our fluid intake. On our right, we can see our loss of fluid. You can see that our general intake and output are about the same. But note that water is gained from eating as well as whatever we're drinking. And it's generally going to be lost through not only urine, but our skin, lungs, and feces. So let's start going through some of our combining forms. We have uro, which we've already talked about, and that means urine or urinary tract. Urino is going to refer to urine alone. The suffix urea refers to urine or urination. And Asian just means a process. Albumo is going to refer to albumin. So if somebody has albuminuria, that means that there's an abnormal presence of albumin in the urine. Albumin is a plasma protein that we find within our blood. Next, we have the suffix esis, and this means action, process, or result of. So if you have diuresis, that is the process of increased urine. We also have glycoso, which we talked about in our digestive system unit, and this means sugar. Glycosuria, that means that we have the presence of sugar in urine. Oligo means few or scanty. So if we use the term oliguria, that means that we have a smaller amount of urine output, about 500 milliliters per day. Now you're going to turn to page 252 in your book, and we are going to label these organs that belong to the urinary system. 
So at the number one, we have our kidneys. They're shaped like a kidney bean, which is how they got their name. And we're gonna find this in the back of the abdominal cavity. So we would say this is retroperitoneal. Next we have at the number two, we have ureter. Ureter is spelled U-R-E-T-E-R. -E -E okay, and you could see that we have this on the other side too. This ureter helps to convey urine from the kidney down to number three, which is our urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is where our urine is stored. And once our bladder fills, then we are going to decide to urinate and through voluntary control, we can release the urine to go through number four, which is the urethra. So urethra is spelled U-R-E-T-H-R-A. Next, let's go through some more word parts. So we have nephro or reno that is referring to the kidney. We have ureto that refers to our ureter. Remember that was that long tube that brought urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. Next we have cysto or cyst, which means bladder, or sometimes it's referring to a sac. And then urethro, which refers to the urethra. So if I gave you the term nephromegaly, what would that mean? Nephromegaly. That means an enlarged kidney. So let's look at a cross section of a kidney here. So we took our kidney and sliced it in half so that we're dividing the front and back from one another. So what we want to note is our, there's my mouse, our renal pelvis here. It's this section over here. My mouse is not cooperating with me today. Um, and it's a funnel shape. And this is directly connecting to the ureter, which you can see narrows down as we head out the kidney. We can also see that it has a fibrous capsule surrounding the kidney. And this helps to provide protection for our delicate internal structures. Extending out of the kidney, we have our renal artery and a renal vein. The renal artery is going to en um, enter the kidney to give oxygenated blood. That blood actually filters through a portion of the kidney we'll get to in a moment. And then deoxygenated blood will exit out the kidney through the renal vein. The other thing that you can see here are these renal pyramids. And so soon we're gonna see that there is a structure out here called the nephron that helps us with urine production. And part of that last section called the collecting duct or collecting tubule will all extend through these renal pyramids and drip that urine through these sections here, okay, which You'll learn in anatomy, these are our minor calyces. These would be major calyces, which all filter into our renal pelvis and then out the ureter. So this is that nephron, the network of tubes that I was referring to in our previous picture. So let me go back real quick. So this nephron is found in this region here, part of the cortex and portions of it dip down into these renal pyramids or the medulla. So let's go back real quick. We have quite the, um, the amount of parts to learn on this nephron. We have um, this entire tube that's a little bit of the yellow color serving as our nephron. In our nephron, the proximal portion here, meaning the origin of it, we have Bowman's capsule. And in Bowman's capsule, we have this network of capillaries called the glomerulus. So the blood comes in through this afferent arterial, and in this area, our glomerulus will filter through certain pressures and take out components of our blood and it'll be placed in our Bowman's capsule. From there, it goes into our proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal meaning it's close to our origin, 
convoluted because it's kind of folded on itself like a convoluted um, shape and tubule because it's a tube. Then it dips down. This is our loop of Henle and you could see that it has a descending limb that would course down and an ascending limb that courses up. And then we have a distal convoluted tub tubule, distal meaning further away from the origin and convoluted and tubule for the same reason we saw before. And all of these distal convoluted tubules will attach to a collecting duct. So remember we talked about that collecting duct being found in this renal pyramid and the urine dripping into what will eventually be our renal pelvis and the ureter. So we have a bunch of these nephrons within our kidney that are all working to filter the blood. So we've got little capillaries surrounding these nephrons. Let's go into some more word parts here. So anytime we see Pilo, that's going to refer to our renal pelvis that we saw in two slides before. And then glomerulo refers to the glomerulus. Remember, that was the network of capillaries in which filtration is going to take place. So sometimes people suffer from glomerulonephritis, and that means inflammation of the glomeruli of our kidney. And here's another more simplified picture of our nephron. You could see here is our glomerulus, and this is where we have the blood becoming filtered. So <clears throat> when components of the blood moves into Bowman's capsule out here, such as water, sugar, salts, and waste, this is called a filtrate. That filtrate then goes through the rest of our nephron, so the rest of the tubes, and will go through something called tubular reabsorption. So even though we just took out water, sugar, salts, and so forth, it is reabsorbed. So it goes from the tubule back into the blood because maybe we still need some of the components that we filtered out. Then as we move through the tubule, as we get to the distal portion, we have some uh, or the majority of tubular secretion take place. What that means is now some of the components that we put into our blood, we might be moving back into the tubules. So components like hydrogen uh, ions or potassium ions and certain drugs will move into the tubules and then that will be excreted as urine. So this is a nice summary of our formation of urine. We already talked about how our glomerulus creates filtrate that comes into our Bowman's capsule, moves through our renal tubule into the renal pelvis, and moves through the ureter into the urinary bladder, and then out the urethra to our external environment. And the same thing that happens on our right side is going to happen on the left side. Now let's move into some diagnostic terms. Urinalysis, which we can also use U slash A or UA to refer to, was originally called urine analysis. It is a physical, chemical, and microscopic examination of urine and it checks for substances within the urine that is not supposed to be there, such as bacteria, blood, protein, um, usually albumin, any pus, sugar, or ketone bodies. If your doctor says that they need to do a urine culture on you, that means they want to do a test to see if you have any germs or bacteria in your urine that can cause a urinary tract infection. Sometimes you also need to do an antibiotic sensitivity test where the test is done to help choose the proper antibiotic that's going to be most effective against the specific type of bacteria or fungus that they found in the urine culture. Also certain types of bacteria or fungus that may be found are resistant to certain antibiotics so it's best to know the exact type that you're going to need. Next we have the terms 
glycosuria, which we've mentioned these terms before in chapter 9. And you know that means that we have sugar within the urine. Hematuria means we have blood in the urine. Albuminuria means we have albumin in the urine. Proteinuria is going to mean we have protein in your urine. Pyuria means we have pus in the urine. And ketoneuria means that we have ketones in the urine. We know that we have ketones in our urine when our body's fat stores are going to be metabolized for energy, which gives an excess of this metabolic end product. Next, we have a blood urea nitrogen test, or what's known as a BUN test. And this measures the amount of urea that we have in the blood. It's directly related to the metabolic function of our liver and excretory functions of our kidney. So here's what a simple urine test looks like. It's going to include the use of a urometer, which you see in A over there. And this shows us the degree of concentration of a sample of urine. We're going to use a glucose test strip to determine if we have glucose within the urine or the use of a multi-stick, which you see all the way on the right in letter C, which are reagent strips that are going to test for various chemical constituents. Here is a microscopic examination of urine that's going to show us cells such as red blood cells that you see in letter A or white blood cells which you can see in letter B. This is an image of a renal arteriogram. To get this arteriogram, we need to perform a renal angiography. And this is going to be a radiographic study that is going to assess our arterial blood supply to the kidneys. This requires that we have an injection of a radiopaque contrast so that we can kind of highlight the renal arteries by a catheter and record. And the record that is produced is a renal arteriogram. This is showing that there is a stenosis at the red arrow of our right renal artery. Remember that stenosis means that we have a constriction or narrowing. Some more diagnostic terms here. First, we have catheter. And our process of inserting the catheter is called catheterization. A catheterized urine specimen is going to be obtained by placing the catheter in the bladder and withdrawing urine, which is going to provide uncontaminated urine samples. Catheterization can be used for collection of sterile or an uncontaminated specimen, installation of medications, or contrast media for drainage of the bladder during surgery, or in cases of obstruction or paralysis. So we have a quick quiz question here. The term for the presence of blood in the urine is? If you answered C, hematuria, you are correct. Remember that glucosuria is excess sugar in the urine, pyuria is presence of pus in the urine, and ketoneuria is the presence of ketones in the urine. Here we have an image of a nephrotomogram. A nephrotomogram is a radiograph of the kidney. Nephrotomography is helpful in assessing the various planes of tissue for tumors, cysts, or stones. This next picture is kidney cancer, and you could see on the top left here, or the top right rather, remember everything is backwards when we're looking at a picture, is a cancerous tumor. This can be detected using a nephrosonography, which is going to use an ultrasound to make a record of the kidneys. Here we have an image of a intravenous urogram. This is an x-ray image that was taken with contrast medium, cleared from the blood by the kidneys. So you can see that 
The renal pelvis of the kidney is highlighted as well as part of the ureter and looks nice and normal. Here we have a cystoscopy and this usually is going to involve a urethroscope. Here the instrument, a cystoscope, is placed inside the male bladder. So the cystoscope here is being passed through the urethra towards the bladder and the mucous membrane is being examined by using the light and mirrors and special lenses. Here's an image of cystolithiasis and this is showing us the presence of stones within the urinary bladder. There are numerous stones here. One we could see is in the urethra over here. And we could see that the bladder wall is very thickened as well. So let's continue to talk about some diseases and disorders. First we have nephromalacia. Remember the suffix malacia means softening, so this is softening of the kidney. Next we have nephrolithiasis or nephrolith, and this is a condition marked by the presence of kidney stones. Nephrolinth is a word for kidney stones, but typically what we use for kidney stones is renal calculi. Nephritis, I'm sure you got this one, but it means inflammation of the kidney. This is also called Bright's disease, B-R-I-G-H-T, Bright's disease. And the most common form of acute nephritis is glomerulonephritis, where we have inflammation of the glomeruli, that network of capillaries. We have some terms you've had before, dysuria, which means difficulty urinating, polyuria, which means excessive urine output, anuria, which means that maybe a person is not able to urinate, so there's no urine. Oliguria means scanty or few urine, so meaning we don't have as much urine output as we should. Uremia is going to be a toxic condition in which nitrogen-containing waste is not properly removed from our blood by the kidneys. So this word literally means urea in the blood, but uremia is more of a toxic condition where our, we have renal insufficiency or failure. It's not uh, filtering the blood properly. And then we have renal failure, and this can either be acute and referred to as ARF, acute renal failure, or CRF for chronic renal failure. Here's an image of what renal cell carcinoma looks like. This specimen is showing us a macroscopic appearance of an excised kidney with a large tumor. So let me outline this tumor for you this entire portion is the tumor. Here we can see a normal bladder versus a cystocele. So a cystocele is going to be a bladder hernia that in this case is protruding into the vagina. So on the left at letter A we see a normal urinary bladder in relationship to other pelvic structures such as the vagina here and the uterus over here. Whereas in this image at letter B, we see a herniation of the bladder. It's just kind of drooping down and protruding into the vagina. And typically that happens if you have birthed many children. So next we have the term nephrotoxic. So what that means is it is poisonous to the kidney. And then we have polycystic kidney disease, and I have an image of that coming up. This is a hereditary disorder that's characterized by hundreds of fluid-filled cysts throughout both of the kidneys. So they look like little grapes all over the kidney. Next we have a polyp, and a polyp is a tumor that's found on the mucosal surface, such as the inner lining of the bladder. 
And we mentioned renal failure in the slide previously, and that just means we have failure of the kidney to perform their essential functions. Remember that there's acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. When someone is said to have renal insufficiency, that means they have a reduced ability of the kidney to perform its functions. So here is that image of a polycystic kidney, and this one looks pretty bad in comparison to the normal kidney found on the left side here. So this is our normal kidney, and here you could see these cysts all throughout the kidney. Next we have a urinary tract infection, or a UTI. This could happen anywhere along the urinary tract. Next we have urinary incontinence. What this means is that someone has the inability to hold the urine in the bladder. So when you see incontinence, that means they have trouble holding it in. And usually, again, women who have given multiple births will suffer from uh, some level of urinary incontinence. Urinary retention is the inability to empty the bladder, and usually males as they age will have more trouble with this. Quick quiz, dysuria is A, excretion of an abnormally large quantity of urine, B, painful urination, C, absence of urination, or D, diminished capacity to form urine. And the answer is B, dysuria is painful urination. Here are our next terms. We have nephrostomy, and this is the creation of a new opening into the renal pelvis of the kidney. Nephrectomy, okay, a little different ending here, means that we are surgically removing the kidney. If we have a laparoscopic nephrectomy, that means we're removing the kidney, but the laparoscopic portion means that we are making several small incisions in the abdominal wall in order to do this. Next we have nephropexy, and this means a surgical attachment of a prolapsed kidney. A percutaneous bladder biopsy means that we are getting a specimen using a needle puncture of the skin and tissue overlying the bladder. A percutaneous renal biopsy means we're getting a specimen using a needle puncture of the skin and tissue overlying the kidney because of that term renal in there. Next we have cystectomy. This means surgical remover, removal of the bladder. Usually we need to perform this if someone is suffering from bladder cancer or someone can have a cystostomy, which means a surgical creation of a new opening into the bladder. So here are different forms of urinary diversion. In letter A, you can see urethral catheterization, moving through the urethra and up into the urinary bladder. In letter B, we see a urethral catheterization as well, just a different view. In letter C, we see a suprapubic catheterization. So here they have made a new opening in order to move the catheter through into the urinary bladder. And then we have at the letter D, a percutaneous nephrostomy where we have gone through the back in order to access the kidney. Here's an image depicting the removal of a kidney stone. We see the renal calculus here. I will highlight it with my mouse in this region here. And this has been caught in something called a stone basket. After we do a percutaneous nephrostomy, the stone basket is maneuvered to engage the renal calculus, and then both are removed using a cannula. Now we'll talk about some surgical and therapeutic interventions. First, we have hemodialysis. 
or what you probably know as kidney dialysis. And this require, is required if the kidneys fail to remove waste products from the blood. It's going to diffuse blood through a membrane to remove toxic materials and maintain a proper chemical balance. Peritoneal dialysis is an alternative to hemodialysis, and this is where we use a solution that is introduced into and removed from the peritoneal cavity. Remember that the peritoneum is going to line our abdominal cavity. A renal transplant means that we have a donation of a kidney from a suitable donor to another person. An immunosuppressive therapy must be used if they have a renal transplant because it'll interfere with the normal immune response of the person receiving the kidney so that the transplant can stay intact in the body and not be attacked by their immune system and we can prevent rejection of that donor kidney. So here is the incision for a nephrectomy. This is called a flank incision. And we use this for a kidney transplant. Here's an image of a nephroscope being used in nephroscopy. Nephroscopy is going to enable a urologist to break up stones in the kidney pelvis and then remove them by suctioning through the nephroscope. Here are some terms that you might be familiar with or can probably figure out what they mean. First, we have lithotripsy, which is surgical crushing of the stone, either by surgical crushing, shock wave, or a laser. When we use shock waves, that means we are performing extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, or ESWL. Extra meaning outside. Corporo meaning body and eel meaning pertaining to. And then the fragments are washed out or expelled. A lithotrite is an instrument that's used for surgical crushing of bladder stones. And next we have nephrolithotomy or pileonephrotomy. And both of these are incisions into the kidney and renal pelvis in order to remove a stone, respectively. Nephropexy is going to mean a surgical attachment of a prolapsed kidney, and urethroplasty is a surgical repair of a ureter. Quick quest question we have nephrectomy is A, surgical removal of a kidney, B, creation of a surgical opening into the renal pelvis, C, surgical removal of the bladder, or D, surgical attachment of a prolapsed kidney. If you answered A, nephrectomy is surgical removal of the kidney, you are correct. So next we have some acronyms and abbreviations. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. That is spelled A-N-T-I-D-I-U-R-E-T-I-C hormone. And this, when secreted from our posterior pituitary gland, helps us to reabsorb water into our blood. You already know ARF, that stands for acute renal failure. We already talked about the BUN test as well, that stands for blood, urea, and nitrogen. CRF we discussed as well, that was for chronic renal failure. ESW was for extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. IVP stands for intravenous pileography. Next we have PH, which stands for potential hydrogen. TUR is for transurethral resection, in which small pieces of tissue from a nearby structure are removed through the wall of the urethra. One of the surgery types is a transurethral resection of the prostate. So that's what TURP stands for. T-U-R-P, once again, is for transurethral resection of the prostate. In TURP, the surgery is going to be performed on our prostate gland in men, and 
we use an instrument that passes through the wall of the urethra and is sometimes done to alleviate urinary problems of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. U slash A or UA we already mentioned too. That stands for urinalysis. UTI stands for urinary tract infection. So that is it for chapter 10. Remember, if you complete all of your exercises and show them to me in class, you gain points. And let me know if you have any questions.